See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. Vaccines and vaccination, they've become some of the hottest topics of public discourse. In recent weeks, the FDA approved a COVID vaccine for kids ages 5 through 11, COVID boosters for adults 65 and older, and those at higher risk for COVID. And the World Health Organization recommended widespread use of a long-awaited malaria vaccine for children. With so much vaccine progress and science to celebrate and understand, we wanted to check back in with Melody Butler, the founder and executive director of the nurse-driven nonprofit public health advocacy group, Nurses Who Vaccinate, to get an update on how she and nurses around the world are responding, mobilizing, and innovating our vaccination efforts, messaging, and communication and revisit an episode we recorded with Melody in 2020. What prompted our earlier episode with Melody was not COVID, but instead the pockets of measles outbreaks taking place in different parts of the world, the increasing rate of un- and under-vaccinated children around the world, and the rate, root, and virulence of vaccine misinformation, and how nurses who vaccinate are leading innovative approaches to build trust and vaccine confidence. And while the world has dramatically changed since that episode aired in 2020, so much of what she shared remains relevant and helpful as we navigate the next phase and our exit strategy of the COVID pandemic. So, Melody, it is so good to catch back up with you. And the last time that we spoke, it was the beginning of 2020, and we had no idea that life was about to change. How have you been since then? Busy. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the understatement of the century, but go ahead. Uh, um, I think I'm still processing what has happened, what is currently going on, and trying to figure out how to anticipate what's on the horizon. So yes, while it's an understatement, that's all I really have the mental energy to come up with to sum up what's been happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to be quite fair, um, well, it's been insane. When we were thinking about developing the episode, Nurses Who Vaccinate, what prompted us was this the, the measles outbreaks that were happening around the world and the um, questions that more and more people were having about vaccinations. And then just in general, the work that you're doing um, with the organization Nurses Who Vaccinate and all the different ways that you're reaching out into the community online, in person, and helping people to understand the importance of vaccinations, the science behind it, the prevention. <laughs> and you were already very busy. And now across the globe, we have been swept up in the importance of vaccines and the anticipation and the science and everything from gratitude and excitement to concern and hesitation. How do you characterize it? Well, vaccines went from being something you learned about in history books, hearing about when she started having kids. It was always there in the background. You only paid attention if you were going to the doctor's office. It was maybe your yearly flu shot a visit, if it even came up in conversation. And here it is, everyone from three-year-olds to 83-year-olds are asking questions, investigating, reading about it. It's really on the forefront of everyone's day-to-day -day conversation. Yeah, you're right. Vaccinations have been the foundation of public health. They've lived quietly and comfortably in the fabric, and now they are absolutely front and center. So I wanted to go through just a couple of questions with you and see if I can get you to bring us up to date. How many children have fallen behind across the globe on their regularly scheduled vaccines? What do we need to do to get caught back up? What are the risks and concerns that we're facing? The most important message I want to get out there to anyone who's listening, 
is that if your child or yourself, if you have not gone for your regular checkup, this is not the time to be delaying vaccines. The viruses, the bacteria, the microbes that we vaccinate for, they, they see this opportunity and it won't be COVID that we just have to worry about. We'd have ongoing issues in regard in our communities where we have pockets of huge unvaccinated children who are now so at risk for the diseases, for example, measles, polio, diphtheria, pertussis. Vaccination rates have really dropped to dangerous levels, not concerning, not worrisome, but dangerous levels. The World Health Organization and UNICEF, they've been tracking this across the globe. And according to their estimations, 23 million children missed out on basic vaccines as far as being fully vaccinated. It dropped to its lowest rate since 2009. And I, I think one of the things that frightens me most is the statistic that they shared that 17 million children around the world are what they considered zero dose children, meaning they haven't had a single dose of any of their life-saving routine vaccines. And now we've got all of them coming back into school and we're heading into flu season and we are at our capacity within hospitals. This is absolutely not the time to be delaying any routine care, any routine visits, because we've already had so much delay in that. Absolutely. Absolutely. One vaccine in particular that I'm concerned about is the HPV vaccine. There was a nearly 21% decrease comparing to the pre-pandemic levels. So 21% decrease. So what does that translate to? So that means that we have adolescents, young adults who missed their 2020, 2021 HPV vaccine boosters. And now we have this population that is at risk for contracting this virus. And it's important to remember that those kids are now maybe heading off to college or they're now resuming activities um, that put them at risk for contracting this virus. And that's really dangerous. I mean, that's something that we need to be talking more about. We need to make sure that the message is getting out there that now is the time to get that series. And Melody, can I get you to explain HPV, the virus, and what diseases that causes? Um, there's such a growing list of what it causes. I just want to make sure yeah. I get the full list of all the cancers. Okay. Give me one second. I think that this is really setting that great example for anybody who's providing information that there are really great sources to be looking for information. And oh. it's great not only to share that information with others, but to check yourself because it is, it is a evolving science and we are learning together and we just need to be developing that habit of continually checking ourselves and checking the resources. Yes, absolutely. I always want to make sure, like you said, I have the most up-to-date, accurate information when I'm presenting it to my patients, to the community, and to fellow colleagues. One of my go-to places, of course, is going to be the CDC. I also go to American Academy of Pediatrics, American Nursing Association. Those are all my resources that I, I like to have at my fingertips. So for the human papillomavirus, the things that we're concerned about are types of cancer. And it's not just cancer found in women. It's not just cervical, vaginal, or vulval cancer, but we're worried about penile cancer in men. We have to worry about rectum cancer in both. And here's the one I wanted to confirm to make sure, back of the throat. So we're seeing an increase in tongue, tonsils, and the pharynx. Those areas are at increased risk from cancer when someone has contracted HPV. The strains that we are vaccinated against in the vaccine they can prevent over 90% of these types of cancers. So that's why it's so important. And we have found that when HPV is given around 11, 12, 13 years of age, it works best. And those kids have the best immune response. They have minimal side effects and they have such long lasting protection against these particular types of cancers. And when we spoke in 2020, we pointed to Australia, the role of policy and leadership, and the success that they've had with the HPV vaccine in reducing and eradicating infections and cancer. Let's listen back to that conversation. I'm thinking how important it is that 
the people who have influence, particularly in policy and legislative roles, how important it is for them to speak from a place of scientific accuracy and vaccine confidence. And the difference that that makes in how they establish policies and what's coming to mind is I'm thinking about um, HPV and how Australia decided to make a commitment to that and their policies reflect it. And I, the last information I read about that is that Australia, they are anticipating that within 10 years, that will be eradicated. You will not see any cervical cancers as a result of HPV. And that started, what, eight years ago or so with their policies. And they've seen a precipitous drop in the uh, incidence of cervical cancer. So the fact that their policymakers, our legislators, had a high level of confidence has made a dramatic impact. And I, I'm sure that you can point to several examples um, domestically and, and around the world where that has made a huge difference. Yes. Uh, Australia is one of my favorite examples to use because had we implemented HPV protection laws around the same time they did, we would be seeing the same kind of results. And it's heartbreaking to know that we have thousands of deaths from cervical cancer, throat cancer, mouth cancer, you know, rectal cancer, and that, that had, could have been prevented had people been vaccinated or had access to the HPV vaccine or just known that it's safe and effective and it works. Flu season. It is upon us. Um, a lot of questions about where should people go to get their flu vaccine? Is it okay to get their flu vaccine along with the COVID vaccine or catching up to date with some of the vaccines that they might be behind on? Um, a good resource for people to find out where they can get an uh, influenza vaccine, a flu shot. You can go to vaccines.gov, G-O-V. And not only will it help you find the flu vaccine, but you can also find in case you need particular COVID-19 vaccines and other vaccines. Your second question, who can get the vaccine and can you get it at the same time as others? You can get both vaccines together and the flu vaccine can be given with other vaccines, such as the pneumococcal vaccine. If you're looking for your shingles vaccine, if kids are in for their regular well visit for their physicals and they're getting their regular boosters or series, for example, maybe hepatitis or, you know, or any HPV. other <laughs> HPV, right? So you can also get the flu shot at the same time. You don't need to schedule a separate visit. It's actually really important that people do get the flu shot as soon as possible during the season too. All yes. right. COVID boosters. We've got a lot of new information where the CDC has made recommendations. FDA has approved some of the vaccines for boosters. I think what we're looking for is who should be getting them. And I guess the other piece is to stay up to date because the information is evolving where to go to get that information. Correct. So people who have completed their initial series at least six months ago, and you are 65 years and older, if you live in a long-term care setting, such as like a nursing home, if you're in rehab, if you're living in a community group home, if you have underlying medical conditions, if you work in high risk settings, such as you're a first responder, if you're education staff, like a teacher, a healthcare workers, you also are um, a candidate to get the booster. So the medical conditions that we want to talk about are uh, individuals who have a history of cancer or they're currently going through cancer treatment. If you have chronic kidney disease, chronic lung diseases, and this includes asthma, if you have COPD, if you've had history or if you know you've had damage or scarred lung tissue from a prior illness, anyone with cystic fibrosis or a lung transplant, or if you have history of pulmonary hypertension, individuals who are diabetic, neurological conditions such as dementia or even Down syndrome put you at increased risk from complications of covid heart conditions, HIV history, being immunocompromised. When it, maybe you're on getting biologics to you know, help treat a condition or you're on corticosteroids. Maybe you have lupus or psoriasis and you, you need a biologic that you get. You are considered immunocompromised. Liver disease, obesity, and smoking. Smoking is something we need to talk more about and make sure people are aware that if you are a smoker, you are at increased risk for complications in COVID as well. So that's basically the, the main ones in a bunch about who should be getting this booster. 
COVID vaccinations and children, those that are under 12. That is the question on so many parents' mind right now. Yes. Give me one second. I am pulling up the American Academy of Pediatrics and Children's Hospital Association. They release a report every two weeks with the latest statistics and numbers about COVID-19 cases in children under 18. As of September 23rd, children represented 16% of all cases. And it's really important to remember that this is not the full data. There are some states that are slow to upload their data that may be withholding data or maybe just aren't collecting the data that we need to really put a full picture on this. So there is reason to believe that this is underreporting. What can you say about the data and the research trials on children between the ages of 5 and 12? Oh, yes. The latest report from Pfizer was showing that children 5 to 11, that their results from one of their trials uh, was showing that it was incredibly effective and safe. And what was interesting is that this particular trial was using a smaller vaccine dosage, 10 micrograms, compared to the 30 micrograms that we were using in people 12 and older. And even with this smaller dose, they were seeing great effectiveness and safety. And basically how they measure how effective it is in the children who are in the clinical trial is they are measuring the antibody levels. They're not really waiting for children to be exposed and see if they get sick. The children who are involved in the clinical trials, they they get blood work done and they're measuring their protection by that route. It's being shown to be very effective and requires a smaller dose. In general, we always see a lot of hesitancy when it comes to brand new vaccines for children. So I'm hoping that that really does help to address any of those concerns. And once this vaccine is available, based on what I've been seeing and hearing from the experts and the researchers, I will be getting my children vaccinated as soon as possible. And I think one of the big messages is people who are pregnant to make sure that they and their families have the confidence and the encouragement to become vaccinated, that these vaccines are incredibly safe, whether it's the flu, covid We need to make sure our our new lives that are coming and those who are carrying those new lives, that we keep them protected as well. Melody, again, trying to get all this information out there. There are a lot of folks who think, well, I've already had COVID, so I have natural immunity and I don't need to get vaccinated. Uh, Fact or fiction? I can't stress enough that if you have already had COVID-19, please go get the COVID-19 vaccine because here's what we're seeing. Natural immunity wear off in a couple months, and people who are not vaccinated are getting very, very sick. So maybe you had a mild case of COVID 19, but we're seeing those people come back and we're seeing those people come into the hospital with a lot more complications and um, they're, they're sicker. Natural immunity is not enough. You need the vaccine, and the vaccine is safe and effective. For those who've had COVID-19, and I will say personally, I had COVID. Um, I had a mild to moderate case um, and I did get vaccinated. And what the reports are saying that there is a robust immunity for those who are fully vaccinated after contracting the virus. And we have evidence that the vaccine offers better protection than natural immunity alone. So that's the only way we can really protect against reinfection. The risk of reinfection is real. And we do see that. This might be a good time to return once again to our conversation from 2020, because one of the things we discussed was innovation to address under vaccination and low vaccination rates and doing so by increasing access to vaccination and expanding the pool of vaccinators. We have a tendency to focus on the small, pretty small segment of our population that are vaccine hesitant, vaccine resistance, or anti. But the vast majority of um, children who are under vaccinated, it's a result of they've missed a well child visit. This is a group of parents who believe in vaccines, trust vaccines, want to have their children vaccinated. But because of probably a logistics or a scheduling challenge, their children haven't stayed current with their vaccine schedules. What are some of the 
technology approaches because that's not an education issue. That is how do we just make sure that the availability and delivery of it maps to people's lifestyles. So what I see in regards to this is not just technology playing a part in this, but increasing um, the access by the technicians who can administer the vaccines. So in recent years, we finally have been able to allow for pharmacists to provide vaccines, um, not just flu shots, but a variety of immunizations. Now we're getting more comfortable with them administering other vaccines. Um, we need to start looking into educating pharmacists so they can feel comfortable and confident to vaccinate children um, so that we can, you know, for those parents who can't make the well visits at their physician's offices, they are able to maybe get a prescription or, you know, have something sent over to the pharmacy and they can go to the 24 hour pharmacy when they are able to during whatever fits their schedule and then get their child vaccinated. There are what we like to call um, in our country vaccine deserts where we don't have access to a pharmacy or a clinic or maybe the the hours, you know, vary or sometimes people go there and they have an hour wait time. And, you know, if you're a single mother of three, that, that hour wait time, it may involve you taking a day off from work, which some people can't afford to do. So we need to also work on expanding access, you know, whether it's traveling clinics that we need in parts of our country, uh, working more with people who are able to administer vaccines, but maybe um, they're not necessarily pediatricians, maybe having more mobile immunization clinics that are with n- nursing groups and utilizing nursing students to help get the pocket of our population that don't have access. And just as Melody recommended, That's precisely what we've seen. Improving access to care included everything from drive-through mass vaccination sites where thousands of people per day were vaccinated to going door to door using a canvassing model similar to that used in political campaigning as was brought into the neighborhoods of Philadelphia by nurse practitioner Tarek Khan. There have been partnerships with faith-based organizations and leaders to educate and administer vaccines in sacred and trusted spaces. Partnerships established with barbers and hairdressers as trusted messengers and moments to discuss and administer vaccines. Nurse Maria Gomez, CEO of Mary's Place, a clinic in Washington, D.C. that provides prenatal and postpartum care to Latina women, as she learned and shared, there is no wrong messenger no wrong moment and no wrong door to come through to talk about vaccines. If a client came to Mary's Center for a child's checkup, dental care, a prenatal exam to get homework help or to pick up a check to pay the rent, they had a conversation about vaccines. By talking and listening, they learned what strategies made their clients feel safer and more comfortable with being vaccinated. So let's get back to our conversation with Melody. So this, this moment in time for everybody has been a crisis that allows us to lean into innovation. And we have had to think about getting the entire planet vaccinated all at one time. So it's a huge logistics challenge. I mean, the vaccines are remarkable, but the vaccination effort is probably the hardest part of this. As you have been thinking about and working with and, and so active in the community, What are some of the innovations that you've been able to bring forward that have allowed us to rapidly get many people vaccinated? In regards to what we're doing here at Nurses of Vaccinate, we provide education to the communities and we help support our colleagues. And we're not being met with the same enthusiasm we had so early on in the pandemic. That means our tactics have had to change. So you see a lot of healthcare workers now really embracing a lot of the different social media platforms. We're desperate. We'll get on TikTok. We'll get on Instagram. We're doing whatever we can to educate. Um, And what we do find though, is that one-on-one really does still work while it's time consuming and be very um, exhausting. Let's just name it. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) It it can be exhausting. I was trying to think of a more positive word, but I'll I'll be honest. You're right. It can be exhausting having these circular conversations, but here's the thing. It does work and it can work. It doesn't always work, but the persistence and having patience 
with those who you're trying to provide information to, it can work. And we do see success when talking with vaccine hesitant parents, patients, and members of our community. They can and do come around and they finally do realize why they need to get vaccinated. So when you talk about innovations, I really do find that the more healthcare workers are embracing the social media to educate, the better off we are in the long run. Because one, if we're not using the social media to educate, there's going to be this void that's met by the anti-vaccine movement or those who are vaccine hesitant and spreading misinformation and myths and rumors. Social media also allows us to have these one-on-one conversations. So if we're there providing evidence-based information, they're going to see our information first and hopefully provide that foundation that they need to make safe medical decisions. The last time we talked, I asked you about harassment and so many stories that we had heard where people who were providing vaccine education and helping to support people, I asked you, like, does this happen? And you said every single day. So what the last several months has demonstrated to us is that you were not exaggerating. And um, what we're seeing is that it's just ramped up. And to your point about having social media, um, the partnerships and the collaboration, YouTube announced that they are taking off all of the anti-vaccine information and the misinformation. Do you want to speak to the challenges? And more importantly, how do we support the courageous folks who are continuing to speak up with love and compassion and an, an enormous amount of patience to withstand the attacks and the misinformation. It can be a very anxious situation when you're dealing with these particular conversations day after day, being harassed and badgered, even verbally abused at some points. It really takes a a certain type of personality. It's a trained method of dealing with this. And I'll be honest, not everyone's cut out for it and that's okay. So for those who can't participate in these dialogues, letting them know that it's okay you can't, but please support those who do and let them know whether it's just by a simple like, maybe a private message to your colleagues who are being vocal and speaking out. Sometimes I'll be having a public dialogue or maybe I'll be in the community and I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, is this worth it? And then I'll be reminded maybe through a private message or an email or even someone stopping me in the store saying, oh, I saw what you said you know, at the board of education meeting the other day, or I saw an article you were quoted in and it really spoke volumes to me, or I really appreciate your efforts. And there was like little things like that reminded me that what I'm doing is not in vain, that there are so many people watching and listening, and it's encouraging to go forward to keep doing what we're doing. Do you have any thoughts that you wanted to share on the role of mandates and why they're valuable? Absolutely. So nurses who vaccinate very early on, we had publicly supported the vaccine mandates for healthcare settings and healthcare workplaces. And why is that? Well, mandates are not brand new and we have seen them work throughout history. You can look back to the days of George Washington when he required his armies to receive the smallpox vaccine because he saw how effective it was and how it protected people in the long run. So this is not a foreign concept to us. And the reason for mandates is because the long story short, it's because we care. We lost hundreds of nurses to COVID-19 before we had the vaccine. We lost thousands of healthcare workers and hundreds of thousands of frontline essential workers. Now that we have this technology, how can we honestly let people work in a high risk setting, knowing that they are at risk for either contracting COVID-19 for themselves or bringing it home to their families? How can we, in good spirit, allow someone to be unprotected and work in these situations? We joined with 50 other organizations, and we know that these vaccines will create a safe working place, and they will be protecting our patients. And also, it's important to be reminded that there are going to be some workers who can't be vaccinated because of medical reasons. So the more people who are vaccinated in the work care setting, we're going to be protecting that usually 5% of our colleagues who can't be vaccinated either due to allergies 
But it's so important that we work together as a community, as a healthcare community, to protect everyone. And the only way we can do that is by making sure everyone who can be vaccinated is vaccinated. COVID vaccinations and children. And what about for those parents who have kids under the age of five? What can you say? Oof. All right. For those under the age of five, we're going to have to do our best to protect them. How we usually protect our children who can't be vaccinated for certain types of diseases. We're going to make sure that everyone around them who can be vaccinated is vaccinated. Yeah. You know, really make sure we are educating parents and children on the need to wear a mask when appropriate. Like if you're in an indoor public setting, you definitely want to have a mask on, a one that properly fits your child, that they're comfortable with. Keep teaching the hand hygiene, coughing and sneezing etiquette. If your kid is sick or if you are sick, please stay home. Do not push yourself to go out. We'll have people who maybe have allergy-like symptoms and they're out and about in the community and then they find out that they're positive and that that little stuffy nose they were dealing with for the last four days actually was COVID-19. So I recommend anyone at this point who is experiencing any type of the COVID-19 signs and symptoms to please get tested. The last thing that I'm thinking about is the rate of misinformation. When we spoke last, you introduced us to the case method and how to speak to your vaccine hesitant loved one. So what I usually do when we are uh, having these conversations, whether it's in person or online, I kind of use a very similar format and it's called the case method. It's a framework of conversation that helps me maintain a professional and compassionate tone when I'm discussing vaccines because one is very easy to be led on a tangent and it's very easy to get off track. So to address the question, can it harm my child to get many vaccines at one time? The case method goes, it has C-A-S-E. And C stands for corroborate. And that's where I'm going to acknowledge the parent's concern and find some points that I agree on. And here I'm setting the tone for a respectful, successful talk. A stands for about me. At this point, I would then describe what have I done to build my knowledge? Why should this parent trust me? What is my expertise? Then I bring in the science, S for science, and I will then go over what the science says. And then E, explain advice. I'm going to give my advice to the patient and base my recommendation on the science. I think that method is so cleverly designed. And with Thanksgiving and the holidays coming up, it's good to have on the tip of your tongue. Have you got any updates, recommendations, suggestions on how to have conversations, um, how to overcome any of the anti-vax sentiment or debunk the misinformation? The best way to handle it is to keep doing what we've been doing. You know, using these techniques uh, really help to control the conversation to one that is professional, keeping the, the conversation focused on the concerns, knowing your audience, knowing who is going to be receptive to information and being there as a source of information for others. I'm letting people know that you are credible, that you take the time to research. My concern for my colleagues, fellow nurses and the doctors in the, this community is burnout because it's very easy to get burnt out, especially when we see harassment and the abuse. Remember why we're doing this in the first place. We're doing it because we care. We're doing this because we want to end, end the pandemic. And the only way to end the pandemic is by people getting vaccinated and by staying home when they're sick and by ad adhering to infection prevention techniques. And they're only going to do that if they understand the why behind it. And we need to make sure we're out there explaining the why, about why it's important to wear a mask, why masks work and how they work, why we need to get vaccinated and who should get vaccinated. The reason we're doing it is because we don't want to intimate you and your family members. And I don't want to be reporting your name on the, mor the mortality list to my local department of health. And I don't want to be seeing pictures and posts of my friends and family losing more loved ones. Yeah. You mentioned the, the fatigue and the um, exhaustion and the burnout coming from harassment. I think a big piece of the fatigue and the demoralization comes from seeing people die from preventable diseases. Um, Correct. And I think that that's where the vast majority of the, the fatigue and the um, weariness is, is just, just how many people don't need to die. 
Yeah. I'm, but we can't lose hope though. We can't lose hope. I really do wish that my colleagues remember that we can get through this because I do know firsthand that, you know, these ongoing conversations, they do work, that they're, we can help calm people's fears. We are able to address these questions, but it takes a lot of hope and persistence and patience. Nurse Melody Butler is an infection preventionist, founder of Nurses Who Vaccinate, and a public member of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee that serves the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She tweets and teaches from the Nurses Who Vax handle. You can learn more about Melody, Nurses Who Vaccinate, and find many of the resources mentioned in this episode at seeyounowpodcast.com. As Melody reminds us, respectful listening, compassionate, patient understanding of someone's genuine concern, confusion, and yeah, even fear, is the key to building trust and has been for a long time on many public health issues. And with the growing research, data, and information about COVID vaccines and vaccination rates, we're learning a lot and adjusting as we gain better insights and understanding. Some key research on the public's attitudes about vaccines comes from groups like the Vaccine Confidence Project, the Kaiser Family Foundation's COVID-19 Vaccine Monitor, and the COVID States Project. These academic and research consortiums gather data to assess the economic, social, and health sentiment surrounding the coronavirus and COVID-19 vaccines, as well as identifying the information needs, trusted messages and messengers, and the public's experience with vaccination. In this work, the data finds that significant portions of the unvaccinated public are confused and concerned rather than absolutely opposed to vaccines. Furthermore, research and surveys from these groups find that the unvaccinated overall don't have much trust in institution and authorities. And even those they trust, they trust less. As Melanie stated in our earlier episode, changing someone's deeply held fears is going to take time. Conversations are also a two-way street Learning how to be a good listener is key, as well as having respect. If you're having a conversation with someone you don't respect, you're not going to change their mind. Mistrust, misunderstanding, and misinformation may also be fueled by disparities in access to care, the inequities within our healthcare systems, and the low and uneven levels of health insurance in the U.S., Research on the unvaccinated by the Kaiser Family Foundation showed that the most powerful predictor of who remained unvaccinated was not age, politics, race, income, or location, but rather the lack of health insurance. Vaccine misinformation, hesitancy, and skepticism are not new, but the difference between vaccine skeptics and misinformation then and now, historians note, is the rise of social media which amplifies debates and falsehoods in a truly new way and has given them a broadcast system and a connected network unlike anything pre-COVID. It's easy to think that people should be more informed or seek advice from a medical provider. But when a large segment of any population doesn't have a primary care provider, access to one, or have health insurance, seeking advice from a trusted healthcare professional or health system It's just not that easy, which is why innovating on providing accurate information, access to care, and building trust with the public and anyone who has a question, concern, misunderstanding, or fear about vaccines is the central mission of Nurses Who Vaccinate. So we invite and encourage you to go back and have a listen to our earlier episodes, number eight, Nurses Who Vax, and number 41, hashtag Vaccines Work building confidence. It might be helpful as the holidays approach and we all navigate vaccine conversations with friends, family, and loved ones. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening and for helping everyone who can get vaccinated. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance health care for all. Learn more at seeyounowpodcast.com.